Okay, we are live. Okay, three, two, one, go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Insecurity, episode number 17. Today's show, we want to talk about why the free public Wi-Fi is, one, not so free and not so good. Again, I'm Haim Cohen, and we are joined again, once again, with Tom Webster. Hey, guys. And so I asked Tom today, I saw an article recently that uh, another bad article saying don't ever use the free public Wi-Fi that you see at the airport. And I know why, but let's get Tom in here to tell us why we absolutely should and we should run away from it. So uh, if that's the article I'm thinking of, it's uh, the Canadian government, basically the Canadian version of the NSA, has been using free airport Wi-Fi to spy on Canadian citizens and whoever passes through those airports and then, you know, gets on free public Wi-Fi to see what they're looking at, to see what sites they're going to, to see if they're going to, you know, donate to terroristorganizations.com. And, uh, you know, at, at the very least, it's a breach of privacy. At the very worst, it's probably illegal. Well, let's start, let's start from the beginning let's let's say hey uh, I need to get online I'm at the airport and I see free public Wi-Fi yeah why w I mean I just need to check my mail I just need to I don't know do something really minor I need to, to, to I, my I Zynga Farmville yeah yeah I've got I've got cows I gotta feed come on man so it's I mean do I have to so worry convenient. Uh, it Honestly, it depends on what you're doing, um, but most of the time, the answer is yes. And it's it's really hard because it's so convenient. You're sitting in Starbucks, you're at the airport. There's you know you're outside uh, uh, someone's apartment complex, and they're taking forever to you know get downstairs so you guys can go out to the bar and grab some drinks. And so you're just like, oh, let me see. Oh, free Wi-Fi. Cool. I'll hook into that so I can watch some YouTube videos. But honestly. With free Wi-Fi, unless it's encrypted with a password, unless you go into Starbucks and they say, hey, free Wi-Fi, but the password is this, and they've got it like written on a big chalkboard up on the wall or something. If the Wi-Fi has no password to it, which is a general rule, um, it's unsafe. It means anyone on that Wi-Fi, anyone within radio range of that Wi-Fi, I don't even have to be connected to it, can see what you're doing online. They can watch your traffic fly back and forth, which is why using HTTPS is so important, by making sure that when you go to your banking website, you've got, you know, the, the SSL lock that says, yeah, you're on a secure connection. You make sure you're connected to HTTPS. Me, sitting in my car outside of Starbucks, I can't see what that is. I see that you're trying to go to mybank.com, but I can't exactly see what's going on in the middle. Now, Let's say you log into WordPress. Let's say you log into your own website or some other website that isn't using a secure connection. I can see everything. I can see your username going by. I can see your passwords. But the cool part is, even if those pieces are encrypted, if the website, which is very common, if the website sends your cookie, the little identifier they give you that says, hey, when you want to remember your login so you don't have to log in each time. I'm going to give you this cookie, this piece of information. Just hand it back to me and we'll get you logged in right away. You don't have to mess with passwords or any of that stuff. And that is usually sent in clear text. Now, sites are getting better about it, but the majority of sites still send cookies in clear text, which means I can snatch that right out of the air and I can provide it to the web server and say, oh, yeah, no, no, really. I'm totally Bob. Really, my name is Bob Smith. Yes, I would love access to his Facebook account. And for the longest time, that was going on with big sites like Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, a lot of banks, like really, really big names. And it's still a huge problem today. Well, let's take a step back first. Let's, let's, uh, so let's, I, I want to classify this in some way. So, and this is sort of out of desperation. I need to get on Wi Fi, <laughs> just like I said, to feed the cows. The Wi-Fi has no password. It's just everyone can get on. If I just want to feed my cows and I don't care, is that a problem, or can they go deeper into my computer? Well, they uh, they can, and it's harder to do. So to watch someone's traffic on open Wi-Fi, that's easy. That's really easy. You know, anyone can do that. You can load up a free program called Wireshark and just 
watch the packets fly throughout the air. You can see everything. It's really cool, actually. If you're at all interested in, you know, what's actually going on in this mystical, magical, wireless Wi-Fi technology, try out Wireshark. It'll be really confusing if you don't know anything about computers, but, I mean, you can see everything. It's kind of cool to watch it all fly by. Do you need to be on? Do you need to be authenticated on the network, or is it, it captures all packets from all networks? It depends on your wireless card, but you can do both. The easiest, simplest way is to attach yourself to the same network, but if you don't want to and you have the right wireless card, you can put it into what's called monitor mode, where it grabs anything I can see. If it can see a packet flying through the air, it'll grab that and show it on the screen and show you, you know, whatever it contains. And if that access point is secure, if it's using WPA2 or WPA, all the data is encrypted. Yeah, sure, it can grab the packet because, yeah, it's you know junk data. I can see it's a packet that is going out to someone, but uh, I can't read any of this. This is a mess. It's all static to me. And uh, that's why you have to use secure Wi-Fi because if not, I could just drive up right alongside your house. You could have the FBI surveillance van waiting outside, and they can read all your packets just like that. Let's now, now, now the protocol 802.11x, which I think is where you, it's, op, it's, it's open, but you have to authenticate yourself. What about that? It depends on how it's set up, because you can either have, you can have the authentication component separated from the encryption component. So if you wanted to, you can make someone log in, but have absolutely no encryption on the connection, if you really wanted to structure it that way. Now... It's probably hard to do. It's probably against all the manufacturer's recommended specifications. But if you really, really wanted to, yeah. I've seen these things set up with WEP before, so it is possible. So not only does any... I hate 802.11x. It is the worst because your phone, your computer, if you set it to automatically connect to open networks, Google Glass, it connects to it. You think you're good, and then you have to authenticate yourself. So yep. all it does is drain your phone's battery, and it just makes you frustrated until you realize you have to go to a browser and authenticate yourself. And then it's terrible from there. And like you said, now we find out that it may not even be encrypted. It's just a splash screen to stop uh, other people. And most of the time, it's not 802.11x. If, like, if you go to Starbucks and you get the, the web page that says, hey, you have to log in, technically it's still, it's not 802.11x. It doesn't use that protocol. It's just another wall. It's just a wall you have to click to get past, and then the server on the inside says, yeah, no, they've already accepted the agreement. They're good. And they remember your computer's MAC address. They remember one of your identifications, you know, for an hour or two hours. They say, yeah, no, you can totally access whatever for this specified duration of time. And when it elapses, you know, they'll pop up the screen again and say, yeah, you got to accept our agreement that you won't torrent or do anything illegal on our network. And um, so there, there are nefarious things that can happen with, with free Wi-Fi. So we've got... Mr. Phone. Mr. Phone is trying to connect to, I guess this is an access point, to Mr. Access Point. Well, we can have an evil guy, represented here by Google Glass, we can have an evil guy be in the middle, to use a man-in-the-middle attack, and when the phone tries to connect to Mr. Access Point, the evil guy with a really powerful antenna, and it's, it's not expensive, you can get one for 20 bucks, sits in the middle and goes, oh, no, no, really, I'm the access point. Trust me, I'm the access point. And then the phone, instead of connecting over to the real access point, it connects to the guy in the middle. It connects to a man-in-the-middle attack, which means he can see all your traffic, most importantly. Um, he can alter your traffic. There is a great hack that allows people to replace every image on every website you visit with images of kittens. It's a fantastic hack. It's, it really is. It's really entertaining. Uh, there's another one where you can actually turn browser pages upside down, completely upside down. And it's all through a man-in-the-middle attack. So they can alter your traffic, and most of the time, you, people will use man-in-the-middle attacks to serve you different advertisements or serve you malware-laden advertisements or malware websites 
or prevent you from getting to websites and serve you something else instead. So there's the really innocent stuff you can do or the really innocent stuff that can happen when you use open Wi-Fi, and then there's the really nefarious stuff, and that's what you have to protect yourself from. It just sounds like it's, I guess, for the average person. Again, we're talking to the average person. We have a few problems that exist. First, we're now on a shared data plan. That's one. Two, uh, the carriers don't allow you to tether, so you just need to access, like I said, your email quickly. Three, it's just it's so convenient. It's right there, so you end up saying, you know what, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this lack of security. And then until you get hacked. And not only hacked, but you're either getting served ads or they're trying to install malware or they propagate. What's that 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 Wi Fi network that doesn't exist? You know the oh. one I'm talking about? It's like yes. like free it's not it's not free public Wi Fi. I think it's just like free Wi Fi or public Wi Fi. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a piece of malware for Windows computers. Um, and if you didn't know your computer, if it has a wireless card, is perfectly capable of generating its own wireless network. And it's got some really cool uses. So if you've got only one wired connection, you can plug in your laptop and broadcast a wireless network. Have it become a router, essentially, a Wi-Fi router that you can hook other Wi-Fi devices into. It's really convenient. But there's malware out there. And this malware gets to, it gets into your machine and it creates its own Wi-Fi network without you having to set up anything. You just say, you know, sure, you know, let it install. It installs through an exploit. You just let it go, and it creates its own Wi-Fi network that people connect to because it's free open Wi-Fi, and then they get infected through the same exploit, and then it propagates, and it is very, very common. It's just, it's like I said, it's there's a lot of, it's the perfect storm where everyone... We understand it, in, a, in the perfect world, we can just use our data plan. It would work everywhere, and we would just never use Wi-Fi. But then you get the data caps like, like we were just talking about. And in our area, we have Optimum Online. Opt, the cable companies are running their Wi-Fi hotspots everywhere. And you just say, you know what? I'm not doing much. i got to get on really fast. I don't feel like dealing with this or whatever it is. And you just end up using it, and that's when problems arise. Yeah. It's, to be honest, it's not really worth the risk unless you have something to protect yourself. And in the majority of cases, that something is a VPN. And those of us who, you know, work in a big office settings, usually for bigger companies, they've got something where you can, you know, take your computer and tie it back into the corporate network from your home, in case you want to work from home or you're traveling and you need to get some documents from the office server and you're in the hotel. These things are called VPNs or virtual private networks. And what it does is it creates like this tunnel, this encrypted tunnel that it sends all of your data through and it connects you to a secured endpoint. So you've got, you know, your machine and then the company servers. And it creates this encrypted tunnel between the two that it sends all of its traffic through. Now, if you're on free public Wi-Fi and you're sending all of your stuff through this encrypted tunnel, it doesn't matter what program I'm using. I can see you're connected somewhere. I can see you're using a VPN. But can I see anything you're doing? No. And more importantly, can I alter that traffic in any way? Even with a man-in-the-middle attack? No. Not likely. So using a VPN or another tunneling protocol of some sort, would protect you from the majority of free Wi-Fi attacks. Well, let's get now into what are, other than man the middle, what are the, the classic, what are just some normal Wi-Fi attacks that we should worry about? Well, the most famous that uh, you know happened a couple years ago when this wonderful program came out um, is cookie snatching. And we sort of went into this a couple minutes ago, but... Basically, a web server will hand you a cookie, a small piece of data, that you can hand it back to the web server and say, yes, this is my ticket. I am indeed John Smith. And someone can go and snatch that cookie right out of the air and present it to the web server, and they say, actually, I'm John Smith, too. And they have now logged in as you without knowing your username, without knowing your password, without getting past two-factor authentication. They don't have to do that either, depending on how the server's set up. Um, 
so fire sh or uh, yes, fire sheep. What it allowed you to do was a little Firefox add-on. So you've got a normal browser and you've got a sidebar, and all you have to do is hit the Start Capture button. And what it does is it looks in the air, just around the air, for any cookies it can grab. And it starts grabbing all kinds of cookies from you know, Bank of America, from Twitter, from Yahoo, from Facebook. And it lists these people on the side and says, yeah, you know, this is Tom Webster's Twitter account. And you double-click that, and all of a sudden you're logged into Twitter under Tom Webster's account. It's crazy. Just, just by clicking a button and then double-clicking on someone's profile picture you can log in as them. And FireSheet made this trivially easy. And it really brought to light the fact that most websites were sending cookies insecurely. And yeah, it was always a theoretical attack, right? No one was going around doing this in mass. And then they were. Then FireSheet made it so easy that, you know, anyone, literally anyone, my mother could use FireSheet and she could log into someone's account on free public Wi-Fi. And it was anti-security made shiny. It was shiny yes. looking. Oh, it yes. Was it was gorgeous. Very easy. And, and the problem was is that, again, people weren't – it didn't affect people until it happened to them. And they were posting stuff on Facebook that they never did, but someone at the coffee shop was. Yep. And that was – and I guess that was the catalyst. That was the thing that started uh, HTTPS everywhere. On Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, Google already had it, on Yahoo Mail, or on all the email clients, because that was that was the problem. They were accessing these websites through the cookies, and we and we didn't know how to stop it. Then all of a sudden, they said, "You know what? If we made this secure, you can't get in." But the other cool part that FireSheep was stopped by was just having a WPA password, and. So what, what the advice was, and I've done this to many coffee shop owners, was thank you for letting me use the free Wi-Fi, but do me a favor. Let me explain to you what FireSheep is. All you should do is put a blackboard in the back and put, here is today's Wi-Fi password. It'll do two things. One, it forces people to buy something. And two, if you change it, it prevents FireSheep. And even a third benefit, people won't buy once today and then tomorrow just sit outside and steal your Wi-Fi if you change it every day. Exactly. It forces people to, you know, get into the store because, I mean, it's really easy to camp around the corner from a Starbucks. I mean, they're everywhere, right? And tap right into the Wi-Fi. Whereas it's, it's a little harder to, you know, it, it makes you feel bad when you walk into somebody's coffee shop, you sit there with a laptop, and you don't even buy anything. I mean, at that point, you just feel like kind of a bad guy. You just, you're jacking their Wi-Fi, and you didn't even pay for anything. So it's kind of a guilt trip, but yeah, yeah, that's one way to solve it. And, and I mean, like, like we keep on saying, it's, and then, I mean, we can do a whole other episode on wired versus wireless, but wireless, look, wireless came about because we didn't want to run wires everywhere. So we made it easy. Then the attacks started happening. People had open Wi-Fi hotspots, and then they realized people were hijacking it and doing bad things with it. So then they secured it. Look, I've been a number of places where all I wanted was just free Wi-Fi for five minutes to send out this important thing because I didn't have service or whatever it is. But because of the, bat, the people that were out there doing malicious things, people locked it up. So then you're starting to realize, I'll just take anything at this point. And all we can say is, Look, it's a scary world, so you want you really need to worry about staying safe. And FireShe proved it. At least FireShe made a whole bunch of things uh, secure, but it still exists out there. Now, the next question I'm going to ask Tom is: Once you're on the Wi-Fi, either authenticated or not, WPA or not, can they access your computer's files? Uh, it honestly it depends on how your computer is set up. Well, you're probably. So I mean. Let's take the default. The default on all of them is probably to share your C drive. Um, it used to be way, way back. So I'm thinking Windows 2000. Um, service I Pack had, 1 on XP? Probably up to Service Pack 2 yeah, on XP. Yeah. Um, and honestly, it's been a long time. So, yeah, XP had a lot of, until Service Pack 2, it had a lot of very insecure defaults. A lot of things that were really really bad that should have never come to be. But, you know, 
it's back in XP. We weren't really taking security seriously. Yeah, we knew about patches, we knew about viruses, but I mean, come on, we didn't really think anyone was going to scour the internet looking yeah, who's for free players. Who was going to do it? The scary thing is, even if you're all in WPA2, even if you've got a hundred character password on your Wi-Fi router and you are using encryption to the hilt, if you know, my buddy comes over, and I've got my insecure pat. If I've got my insecurely set up computer on the network, and he's on the same network, yeah, he can still get to me. So it's not going to help you if you know you turn off Windows Firewall, if you share your C drive and allow anyone in the world to write files to it. Watch your your shared folders. Be careful of those. And that's why in newer versions of Windows, they have the the idea of okay, this is a public network, so we're going to turn off sharing. And this, this is a corporate network, so some sharing is allowed, but not everything. This is my home network, and I can get to my files from anywhere on home. And then when you connect to a new network, it says, hey, hold on a minute. Is this a home network, a corporate network, or, uh, or something public? And you can choose. You say, oh, this is a public network. And it goes, okay, well, we're going to lock down the firewall and not let too much out unless you tell us to. Be careful of that. Windows 7 has got really intelligent defaults now. Windows Vista is pretty good. XP Service Pack 3 tends to be nice. You should probably upgrade to 7, but, you know, what can you do? Well, you have how many days now? 60 days? Right. Less than 60 days? I am convinced XP will never die. I am very convinced. Well, as of right now, you have 60 days. Right. I'm not making. Well, I'm not taking Tom on that bet, but you, <laughs> you don't have that much longer. We'll and see how long Microsoft holds out. You know what? Look, it's time. Windows 7 is very pretty. It is, and it's fast. It's really fast. The, so, the things, if you haven't looked at it, the things everyone hated about Vista, 7 fixes all of it. It makes it fast. It makes it pretty. It's just, it's a lot better. It's easier to use. So, I mean, then you have, so, I guess the next thing is, so let's give recommendations. For most people, they go around, they want to check something, and my recommendation is, if you're if you're at that point where you need you always looking for free Wi-Fi, you know what? Maybe you should get tethering on your phone. There's a lot of ways to get tethering on your phone that doesn't necessarily pay, where you have or you have to pay. But maybe tethering is the right idea because if you're tethering, what you're doing is you're using a 4G network. And I guess you should ask Tom first: Is 4G or 3G secure? Well, is it secure to other people? Mostly. You so GSM has been cracked. You you can snoop GSM calls, you can snoop GSM data. You have to have some really high tech equipment. You've got to have some expensive equipment. Like stuff that costs more than a couple hundred dollars. It's not gonna be your you know, average nefarious hacker sitting in a coffee shop. I mean, you're gonna notice this guy sitting there with a whole bunch of antennas coming out of a bag. So, are you secure? Yeah, more secure. Um, if you're sitting at an airport and you need to get to a connection, you've got tethering, oh yeah, use it. Use it. So, the only people who are actually going to be hacking you when you're using a tethering connection, as far as sniffing your cell phone traffic, is a government agency, which this will not protect you from the NSA. If you say, well, I'll just tether my phone, then the NSA can't watch me. No, no, they can watch you regardless of your carrier, regardless of what network If you're you paying a carrier, if you're paying a carrier, you are getting snooped by the government. Yes, and snooped by your carrier as well. If they see that you're browsing things you really shouldn't be, you know, if you're if you're torrenting the latest Game of Thrones episode and and you know, the the network comes after them and says, "Hey, someone torrented our Game of Thrones episode. We have their IP right here." Your cell phone company is going to rat you out and you're going to get a letter. So, be careful of that, be intelligent with it, but yeah, you can circumvent most script kitty level hackers, most you know low level hackers that are just sitting there looking for opportunistic ways to get data on people or to you know, do cookie grabbing or anything else, you're going to bypass most of those by tethering. Just remember, you can generate a Wi-Fi network with these phones now. If the Wi-Fi network is open, if you're not using WPA2, if you're not using an encrypted Wi-Fi network, but you're tethering with an open network, it's just as bad as using open Wi-Fi. 
take the second, put even a dumb password on there. Just get, just make sure that lock shows up because most people are that. smart enough nowadays to not say, I wonder what their password is. Right, and and think of it this way. If you don't put a password on your tethered network, somebody can jump on and start watching Netflix, and all of a sudden your data plan runs out in 20 minutes, and you're sitting there wondering, hold on, wait a minute, where did all my data go? And then you look at the stash, and you're just like, oh, wait, somebody just streamed like 8 gigs through it, and now I've got overage charges with AT&T. Like I so, said, people... Be smart. people... People wanted to be nice back in the day, and they left their Wi-Fi open. But nowadays, you can't because someone will get on and start streaming Netflix. So you have that. If you are stuck, first thing to do is maybe find the coffee shop that has a Wi-Fi password before you tre tread down the free public Wi-Fi. Find the place that has a password. Ask them nicely. Mo I'm sure if you find the coffee shop, you buy a coffee from them, they'll let you on. And then... If you're really and the, if you're really stuck and you have no other choice, you know what? If, just be wary of where you go. Make sure it's HTTPS. Make sure your firewall's on, and make sure from there. And if you can get a VPN, maybe it's worth paying for a VPN, depending on how many times you're traveling and how much you need it. And there's there's lots of VPN options out there, and really, and it's. I don't really want to call it a VPN. It, it serves the purpose. It does very different things, and it's really for a completely different type of Internet user. Um, but if you want to, check out, just throw into Google, check out the Tor project. We'll include a link in the show notes. You can actually click a button, and you get bounced through a whole bunch of different nodes all over the Internet and routed out to somewhere random out throughout the world. Now, the downside of this you're going to really slow down your connection. So could you stream Pandora or Google Music? Yeah, probably. Could you watch Netflix in HD? No way. Not at all. Now, could you get onto Facebook? Yeah, definitely. So it's called Tor, and it's really designed to make you semi-anonymous on the Internet. It's used for you know people in countries where their governments are actively targeting them, actively hunting people down. If they post something anti-government, if they go against the status quo, you know, if basically they're trying to shut down free speech and people who want it can use Tor and have a route to the internet that's not watched and that's relatively secure. And the last thing, the poor man's uh, VPN, if you really don't want to pay but you're a little tech savvy, you know what, remote desktop. Remote desktop works. Every, every uh, operating system has a client, it takes some elbow grease it's not perfect, however, in a pinch, you want a remote desktop to a computer at home, it will do the trick where you're using this, it'll just send the screen. Uh, keep in mind, um, VNC does not count in that list of programs. If you use VNC, it is a clear text connection Ooh, unless you I tunnel it. Yeah, unless you tunnel it through something else. So if you're using uh, Microsoft RDP, yeah, that's encrypted by default. If uh, if you're using Team Viewer, I think Team, team viewer. viewer. Yeah, Team Viewer or log me in or uh, go to my PC. All of those are encrypted by default. If you use Free VNC or Tight VNC or any VNC, and you don't pipe it through an encrypted tunnel first, it is clear text. And and that's where. And again, it's one of those things that you wouldn't have think of unless you read the, read the fine print. You would have said, right. oh, but if I do that, I'm just sharing the monitor. And then you uh, realize that, that it's not encrypted. And again, yep. the problem is with the biggest part that we wanted everyone to get from this episode in the last minute is that it's this isn't a hack that goes after the average person. It is so easy to set up shop in the coffee shop and just... <laughs> and just take in packets, take in, take in anything clear text. This is not the hack that we talked about last week. This is not somebody going directly after you. This is a grab everyone's packet because the coffee shop mm -hmm. offered free Wi-Fi or they're it, getting just de people in desperation needing to send out an email or things like that. It is purely opportunistic. It is, hey, <clears throat> I went up to get a refill at McDonald's. I left my purse sitting on the table. No one was watching it, and somebody snatched it. It's purely opportunistic at this point. 
Because if somebody really, really, really wanted to watch you, they'd have better ways to do it, and it would probably cost them a lot more money. Well, it's sad, but no more free public Wi-Fi for any of us. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. I'm going to say good night. Anything else, Tom? I think that's about it. Okay, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. See you, guys. Let me stop.